Welcome, welcome to the Veterans Who Build show. I am very excited for y'all to hear today's episode. Today we have an airborne engineering officer turned very successful AEC industry vet. Someone who led significant teams, built mega projects, everything from border fence to the Tappan Zee Bridge in New York. Just amazing insights into how to grow your career in the AEC industry post-military career. I'd like to give a quick shout out to our subscribers. Thank you to our listeners. A reminder to please like and subscribe to our channels, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Dave Richards. Thank you to our channel sponsors, JetBuild. If you're looking for ways to better manage your real estate development and construction projects, look no further. Jet is the command center software for end-to-end real estate development and construction management. That's www.jet.build. Welcome, welcome everyone to the Veterans Who Build show. Today we have Dave Richards on the show and you know we were just chatting about some awesome projects i'm not gonna spoil what's to come uh but i'm really excited for you to hear about what david dave has worked on and his just career generally speaking both military and profession dave thanks so much man for joining uh how are you doing today where are you calling in from hey i'm great yeah happy to be here thanks for having me adam i'm calling in from scottsdale arizona sunny scottsdale arizona where it's about 75 (laughs) today Ah, that's beautiful. Glad, glad you got the nice weather. I'm guessing mm-hmm. as, as usual, right? Um, right. Yeah. Awesome. So a formal introduction to Dave, uh, Dave Richards served for four years in active duty as an airborne engineering officer serving in Fort Belvoir, Korea and Fort Carson. Dave recently retired from granite construction where he held the title of senior vice president responsible for granite's heavy civil group with work from Guam to the East Coast. That is a serious demographic stretch that I'm excited to hear about uh, when we get to the uh, profession part of uh, our show. Uh, But to kick off, Dave, as you know, we like to start in chronological order. Please tell us about uh, where you grew up, what your childhood was like, and what led you to uh, your service. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. One one correction. I was at Fort Belvoir, which is in Virginia. Then I went mm. from there to Korea. I was at Camp Carroll, which is in Wagon, Korea, and then I uh, mm. went from there to Fort Carson. So, um, so anyway, I grew up on a cattle ranch. Believe it or not, out in the middle of nowhere in uh, southeastern Arizona. You know, to school. I first through third grade, I went to a little one room schoolhouse, and when I was in third grade. Uh, I was just first, second, third grades at that point in the school, and there were six of us, and uh, I was the only boy. So at the time, it didn't seem all that great, but today may not be so bad. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway, um, so grew up on a cattle ranch, uh, uh, then went to high school in a, uh, in a little town called San Simone, Arizona, which was uh, over 40 miles one way by bus over a dirt road. So we got up early in the morning, went to school, and came home and milked the cow and did chores. And, um, my uh, my dad was a World War II veteran. He actually was captured in the Philippines in World War II and spent about four years in a Japanese prison camp. And uh, wow, um, was on the Bataan Death March. I'm sure you probably heard of that. Uh, anyway, mm-hmm. that's kind of what inspired me to uh, to go into the military. So. When I was in high school, I applied for uh, Army Army, and I got a degree in, in civil engineering, bridges, dams, things like that. Was kind of what my emphasis was. Um, so once I uh, once I got out of school, I I uh, it was a period of time. It was I think I don't know three or four months after I graduated. I went to the officer basic course at Fort Belvoir, and actually while I was in college, I went to what they called advanced camp, which is kind of similar to basic training at Fort Riley, Kansas. I did that, I think, my sophomore or junior year of college. I guess it was probably my junior year of college. So anyway, went to uh, went to Fort Belvoir, went to the officer basic course, was there roughly six months, I guess. 
then I went from there to airborne school. And uh, I actually, where I wanted to go, I wanted to go to Alaska. And I actually got orders to Fort Richardson, which is in Alaska. And then I got accepted. I'm not sure how to tell you the truth, but I ex got accepted into a military program called the Technical Enrichment Program, where uh, an officer goes and does a one-year, what they call a greening tour, uh, and it's in Korea, and then comes back, goes to fully funded grad school, and then goes and teaches at West Point. So anyway, I got accepted into that. So instead of going to Alaska where I wanted to go, I got sent to Korea, which was fine. It was uh, it was an interesting experience. And I got to Korea right at the end of the Olympics in 1988. So kind of an interesting time in Korea. I don't know if you recall that period, but after the Olympics, there were student riots and student protests. And anyway, I was there. They were doing all, all that. Uh, I was stationed at a, a small camp called Camp Carroll. I was in Delta Company of the 802nd Engineers, which uh, was a separate company. The battalion uh, was located at Camp Humphreys, which was just south of Seoul. And uh, anyway, we were a separate company in uh, like said, Wagon, which is a small village just north of Tegu. Um, anyway, I was an uh, earth-moving platoon leader. Um, so I had the platoon. We were the 802nd was a construction unit, and um, so anyway, I ran the platoon that had all the all the heavy earth moving equipment, which uh, which was a really you know it was right up my alley and kind of right up kind of what I wanted to do from a career standpoint. So anyway, I was there for a year uh, and then transitioned back to the States. And most of the officers, they were moving the engineer school from Fort Belvoir to Fort Leonard Wood as I was leaving Korea. So most of the officers that were leaving Korea were getting sent to Fort Leonard Wood. And so when I was getting ready to leave, I called the assignments officer. And actually, I knew the guy. I, I had known the guy. He was one of the... Um, guys that helped at the officer basic course. So I, I actually knew him. And anyway, I told him I wanted to go to Fort Carson. And he said, eh, I don't know. Everybody's pretty much getting sent to Fort Leonard. Wood. Let me see what I can do. So a couple of weeks later, I had orders for Fort Carson. So I guess that shows it's not what you know, who you know. Um, so anyway, sure. I, uh, I went from there to, to Fort Carson. Um, Dave, what was, was the, it, what was the reason for uh, wanting to go there instead of the other location? Well, I I don't know. I'm I grew up on the in the West. I'm kind of a Western mm -hmm. guy. I love to hunt. I'm a big hunter, uh, and you know there's great hunting in Colorado. You know a lot of mountains. I like to ski. A lot of skiing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was just uh, an attractive place to to go. Anyway, one thing I failed to mention about uh, Korea too. I I was fairly newlywed when when I went to Korea, and Korea is a mm -hmm. non-sponsored tour, meaning your you know family isn't authorized to go you know they can if you you know pay all the expenses so anyway my wife we didn't have any kids my wife came to korea and she and i lived in a little hooch out in the village in the, the little village of raygon so it was a really interesting experience you know we rented a little house you know out in the hooch and we had uh, or a hooch out in the out in the village we had uh charcoal on doll heat uh you know we lived like a like a korean family so it was a it was an interesting so oh, that's amazing. anyway, what, what was the kind of, uh, in that experience, what was the kind of, I don't know, food, food you were eating? You know, we, we had access to the PX, uh, you know, on the post exchange. So we did most mm. of our shopping, uh, at the, at the post exchange. So, but, you know, we ate, you know, we ate, uh, you know, we ate a lot of uh, Korean food as well. I mean, it's a mm. lot of rice. Kimchi is a big, I don't know if you're familiar with kimchi, but yeah. kimchi is a big, uh, it was a Korean staple. I never became much of a fan of kimchi, but, uh, mm. you know, a lot of, there's a, a Korean beef dish called uh, bulgogi, which, which is really good. Uh, you know, most of what we cooked and ate, we, you know, we got at the PX. So I did a lot mm. of projects around Korea, though. Um, one of the projects I did, I did a bunch of work at a Korean air base uh, in a little town called Pohong. And, um, when we would go like Pohong, I had my my crew of soldiers, so we had uh, you know mess facilities set up. So we ate you know we ate military food. But I did one project um, 
at a Korean air base, I tore down a, a hangar, an aircraft hangar, and I had just Korean workers under me there. And so I live on the village. Hmm. And um, anyway, so I, I, you know, I ate a lot of rice. Like I said, I ate, you know, beef and fish and, you know, kind of, I, I mean, I had eaten restaurants. I ate, you know, Korean food. It was, a, you know, it wasn't. Mm-hmm anywhere near a military base so there was no really american influence there so anyway i i ate like a Korean. funny story there my wife came to visit me one weekend when i was there I, I was there um anyway she came and visit me one weekend during a typhoon and she didn't speak any korean so she had to ride a korean bus to get there and one of her friends had taped like her destination on her and so she <laughs> would show people where she was going and they would help her change buses but anyway, she came and visited right in the middle of the, of the typhoon. I mean, it was a really nasty wow. storm. And uh, wow. so anyway, she showed up there. And <laughs> I guess when she got there, you know, it was, this, it was a small village. And so anyway, they stopped at the bus stop. She didn't see me. Uh, she's scared to get off the bus or not. And it's raining buckets. Anyway, I guess I stepped around the corner and she was she was relieved. But uh, it was a really wow. interesting experience. <laughs> You know, uh, I was gonna, I was, I was about to ask, um, and you kind of brought it up in terms of how, how your wife got there as it relates to communication, right? How how are you communicating with people uh, around you? You know, I had for most of the most of the time, we we had what were called katusas. They were Korean augmentees to the U.S. Army, mm. so they were young Korean soldiers. We had like my platoon had a number of katusas in it, and I had a katusa <laughs> driver. Um, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't drive ourselves. I mean, that's, I can tell stories about you know, our drivers didn't have a lot of driving experience, so it was kind of hairy sometimes, but, uh, anyway, that's crazy. Uh, so yeah, we had, uh, we had Korean drivers that could speak some English, you know, you could communicate with them. And, uh, so anyway, then they, you know, they would help us communicate. Um, but, mm-hmm. uh, my first driver was, uh, was a guy named Sergeant Kim and he actually spoke pretty good English and he was a good driver. He had been my predecessor driver. And my next driver was a driver named Sergeant Lee. And he had not hard, he had hard, hardly at all. <laughs> and, uh, anyway, I mean, it was scary. He would concentrate on the road and you'd ask him, uh, what are you thinking about Lee driving, sir? You know, I mean, he. And like going around corners, sometimes he would turn the corner and he wouldn't turn back and you'd have to reach over and grab the wheel. And anyway, it was, oh, it was, it was kind of hairy riding around <laughs> with him, but he actually got better. He kind of learned to drive after a while. So it wasn't, wasn't too bad. We never got an accident. So. Wow. Well, glad uh, to hear that. I'm sure, I'm sure at the time yeah. it was very stressful. Now it sounds uh, very funny to, to think back on and laugh on just hearing you say it. But I mean, that, yeah. I guess you got to learn somehow, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I would have rather had somebody that knew how to drive. But surprisingly, a lot right. of the Cusas didn't know how to drive. So that's crazy. Anyway. Hmm. So anyway, went from there to Carson. Um, when I first got to Carson, I got assigned to uh, to Charlie Company, and I was a line platoon leader at the Fourth Engineer Battalion, which was a combat engineer battalion uh, supporting the Fourth Infantry Division. So. You know, we did a lot of uh, demo, you know, minefields, uh, obstacles, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, building defensive positions, things like that. We still had some heavy equipment, but uh, it wasn't really about uh, building things. Um, so I was a line platoon leader. I was at Carson for almost three years, or right after three years. Um, and... Uh, I don't remember. I was I was the uh, line platoon leader for probably a year or so, I don't know, maybe a year and a half, and then I became the company executive officer and uh, kind of the second in command to the company commander. And as part of my responsibilities there were I ran the motor pool, so I was responsible for all the maintenance in the you know for the company's equipment. Um, and we had uh, you know we we had heavy equipment as well. We also had a bridge platoon that uh that was uh you know they had a bunch of uh of mobile bridge equipment uh so anyway there were, we had we had i don't remember how many pieces of equipment. we had with vehicles we probably had 100 pieces of equipment so anyway i was responsible for the maintenance for, for all that equipment which is one thing that helped me in my civilian career uh in 
you know, I worked for a construction company called Granite Construction, as you said, and one of the jobs I had with Granite was as our equipment, as a equipment manager for our Arizona region. And the reason I got selected, I actually got asked, it didn't something I applied for, but uh, my boss knew that I had managed equipment while I was in the military. And so anyway, I got asked to be our equipment manager and I was a equipment manager for about three years. Hey, back to, back, back yeah. to Carson. So uh, I was the executive officer for probably a year, maybe a little over a year. And then uh, went from there. Uh, and I decided at that point, uh, I, I would, this was uh, during Desert Storm. I was actually the company executive officer during Desert Storm. And, you know, at that point, I decided I was not going to go forward with the technical enrichment program, and I was going to get out after years. So uh, once I transitioned out of the executive officer, I was the assistant division engineer, which was, was a really interesting role because I spent a lot of time uh, the division commander, which was a one-star general, uh, mm-hmm. and I worked for the division ah. commander, who was a colonel. Um, so it was, uh, it was, wow. so anyway, yeah, what, were I, some, uh, what were some projects you were doing in that, in that role? Well, we did, we did a lot. And again, it was a combat engineer unit, uh, and it was, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, combat arms division. So we weren't really building anything, but one of the things we did is in preparation during desert storm, actually we went and spent. A couple of months at Fort Hood, Texas, with the 155th Armor Brigade, Mississippi National mm-hmm. Guard. They were supposed to have been the first guard unit to deploy to Desert Storm, and so we've spent a few months with them at at uh, Fort Hood, and then we went to Fort Irwin with them, which is the National Training Center, and uh, spent like a month with them at the National Training Center. And the war was actually over before. They got ready to do. Hmm. So anyway, uh, I I don't know to tell you the truth if they were deployed or not. I don't think they did. Hmm. I think, like I said, I, you know that was one of. Well, the, nonetheless, you, know, you were, of, yeah, you were prepping them for, for that war. Is, is training them, yeah, yeah. You know, right, we did a lot right. of training. I mean, I did when I was at, at Fort Carson. I did. I don't know how many. Uh, I probably did eight NTC rotations uh, at the National mm-hmm. Training Center. I actually did two NTC rotations. I went and did two NTC rotations as a, what they call an OC, an observer controller, which is kind of a coach for the units that are going through, uh, you know, the National Training Center. Anyway, it was a great experience. And it helped us because I knew I knew the National Training Center like the back of my hand. So, you know, I really mm-hmm. knew my way around, you know, knew how to get things done. And so it was, you know, we went. My unit got later later on. It you know it kind of helped us. So yeah, well, anyway, my, that my was... interpret my like interpretation of these stages that you're referring to is just like it, amazing absorption of knowledge, right? It's like training uh, National Guard teams for you know X mission training, uh, you right. know this part of the you know process for whatever reason. So I mean, it sounds like we're geared up for some awesome translatable skills as you already uh, touched on, and uh, that right. that sounds yeah. like a really amazing experience overall. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, that was that was uh, that was kind of my military career. Um, mm. You know, I had decided I wanted to get out. Like I said, I don't know. I was probably three and a half years in, and if I had gone through with the technical enrichment program, like I said at the beginning, uh, I had been selected to that, and you know, I would have gone actually for Korea. I would have gone to to grad school. So I had decided, I guess, sometime before that, not to do that, but. Had mm-hmm. I done that, I would have gone to grad school for probably two years, and then I would have spent, I don't know, three or four years probably teaching at West Point. But if I had gone through grad school, I would have had an additional six-year commitment. Um, so I would have been committed through through 10 years, and I had decided at some point that, you know, that I wanted to get out. So anyway, I mm-hmm. didn't, didn't want to commit for, for 10 years. So anyway, I... You know, my transition was actually fairly easy. I was lucky. I mm. had an acquaintance who worked for Granite, the company I ultimately went to work for. And really, it was during Desert Storm, and they weren't letting anybody out at that time. But I had decided that I wanted to get out. So I was talking to him on the phone one day, and he said, hey, Granite's looking for people. Why don't you send a resume? So I said, okay. So I put a resume together, and 
the guy that ran the business called me a couple of weeks later and said, when can you come down? So, you know, within a few weeks, I flew down and interviewed and he made me an offer. And I told him, look, you know, nobody is getting out right now. So I don't know how long it'll take me to get out. Uh, but uh, anyway, I would like to come to work for you when, when I get out. Um, so anyway, he said, okay, that was in August or September probably. And mm -hmm. I got out in January. So yeah, it wow. took a, took a few months. You know, the war was over. They started letting mm -hmm. people out, and anyway, I got out in January. Another funny story. So, um, right before I got out, I was at Fort Hood, and uh, anyway, I flew back to Fort Carson to ETS. Anyway, it was well, Fort Hood was fogged in, and. I had gotten a plane. There was a plane that was coming from somewhere. I don't even remember where it was coming from. It was a military plane. And uh, anyway, so I go to the airport at Fort Hood, and the guy at the airport told me, if that pilot lands in this fog, he's crazy, and I don't think I would get in the plane with him. Um, so anyway, sure enough, he landed, and I got in the plane with him, and we made it to Fort Carson. You know, I started the transition process and got out within a few days. So, so anyway, I had a job lined up already. So I went to work, yeah. to work for Granite. Um, I went to work for Granite as a project engineer and uh, was a project engineer for, uh, I don't know, a year and a half. And as I mentioned earlier, I got asked to, our equipment manager had left. I got asked to be the equipment manager. So I did that uh, for three years, um, which was a, a really good experience. And then I, uh, from there, became a project manager, uh, you know, spent a few years managing various different projects. Um, and then I started bidding work and, and managing work kind of at the same time. So we'd bid some work and maybe go manage the job or, you know, bid smaller jobs and you would have a project engineer on every job and, you know, manage the project engineers that are, are doing the job that, uh, that I was doing. Um, so anyway, spent a few years doing that and then got promoted to chief estimator. So I was the chief estimator for the area, for the Arizona region for about six years. And then from there, I got asked to be the region manager. So I managed the, uh, managed the Arizona region for, uh, six years and, uh, the Arizona region did up to, I think the biggest year we had when I was a manager, we did a hundred. 80 some odd million dollars worth of work um wow and we, we worked in arizona new mexico and into west texas um wow. uh we one of the notable things that we did uh when i was the region manager there is build a uh, border fence um we built uh we built a lot of border fence in fact the first border fence job we had applied for uh uh, MATOC, which is multiple award task order contract. And we knew this was coming. I mean, we didn't really know what it would turn into, but we saw this MATOC advertised. So we, we submitted a statement of qualifications for this MATOC and we got selected. The first job was in, uh, it was near Naco, Arizona, which is a little town, on the border in Southeastern Arizona. And it was, uh, I can't remember, it was like eight miles of border fence. And they only gave us, I think we got the plans on like a Friday and I think it bid the following Wednesday. And they had a site walk on like Monday. So we got the plans wow. and specs on Friday and it was a 20, it was somewhere between 20 and $30 million. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was $24 million if I remember right. Anyway, we so we didn't have it, but we had everybody else tied up in the in the job. So I was the region manager, and our chief estimator was a guy named Chris Rogers. Chris and I were the only two that were available, so we bid the job. And they had a site walk, I think, on Monday. And we went to the site walk, and the army was down there actually building fence. So we got to see what the army was doing. This was a design build job. So you had to come up with your own design for the fence. They gave you some guidelines, but we had to come up with our own design. So we looked at what the army was doing and decided, you know, if that's what they're having the army build. That's, you know, that must be what they want. So anyway, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And so we turned in a bid. I think it was on Wednesday. And we were actually the only contractor that had the nerve to bid the job. So we were the only bidder. 
And you wow. know, it was a really tight time frame too. I mean, there wasn't much time to build the job and it was yeah, you know, it was a really challenging job, but it ended up being a great job and was our was our first four fit job. And we went wow. on to That's build a, a significant amount of uh border fence. Wow. Yeah, so, really interesting. And what you just said was I was about to ask if that led to further projects. It um, did, yeah. Also yeah, we built amazing. Yeah, we, we built uh hundreds and millions of dollars of uh bold wow. work. So yeah, it was wow. it was great work. It, it's incredible to think about what you just said where nobody else was bidding on it. You know, you, you guys did it. You guys put the bid in, you executed the work, and that led to quadruple uh the amount of overall work at contract. So that that's really cool that that happened. Before yeah. you built that fence was I mean, I heard you say Army was, you know, building fence. Was any other uh, contractor doing anything over there on the border? No, that was actually the first fence job. The army had wow. built some fence and they were actually building some fence. The, the first fence that we built was, uh, it was a mess. It was filled with like heavy duty mess that was doubled up where there was only mm. a quarter of an inch opening where somebody couldn't climb it. Um, anyway, the army was actually building and had built a bunch of fence out of, they had old landing mats, which actually I had used, uh, I, I mentioned when I was in Korea, uh, we had hmm. done some work at an air base uh, called Pohong, and we actually built an aircraft parking apron out of these temporary, their steel landing mats. Uh, you know, they were actually made to build uh, temporary runways with. Um, but anyway, the army, there was a bunch of surplus uh, landing mat. The army had built a bunch of fence out of landing mat. Uh, so That's it crazy. was kind of cobbled together with, you know, whatever they could come up with, but the army had built quite a bit of fence in it. Wow. So what, what was the purpose of kind of doubling between what the army was doing and then looking for, you know, external contractors? I mean, government looking for external. I think the army couldn't keep up with what the plan, mm. you know, this was during the Bush administration. Uh, I think mm. they had plans. In fact, they built, I don't know how many total miles of fence were, were built. You know, the Southern borders, 500 and some odd miles long. Mm -hmm. If I remember right, um, that program built, uh, I think almost 200 miles of fence. So wow. the civilian program. So it was a significant quantity of fence. And I think they couldn't, you know, they just didn't have the resources to build the right. quantity of fence. Yeah. That, so anyway, so, that was, you know, yeah. that was one of the big highlights of uh, highlights in Arizona. So then mm -hmm. I got asked to, to go manage Granite's Northwest operating group, which was headquartered in Salt Lake city, Utah. Mm. and had regions in Alaska, Washington, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and then a, a pavement maintenance company called Intermountain Slurry Seal that worked in multiple states. I, Intermountain would work in somewhere between 20 and 25 states every year. So they were kind of gypsies and would, uh, you know, spend all summer on the road doing pavement maintenance type work. So I got asked to manage that. So I did that for uh, about six years, I guess. Um, and then, uh, you know, it was a great experience. I traveled a lot, though. Like I said, I had regions mm -hmm. scattered out all over the place. Um, we had a division that was struggling, which was what we called our heavy civil group, um, which did the mega projects, you know, built. Hmm. You know, big projects I mentioned before we started recording that, that we were part of the Captain Z Bridge in yeah. uh, New York City, which is a three and a half billion dollar project. Uh, some other notable projects we had were I-4 in Orlando, Florida, uh, widening hmm. I-4 through the middle of Orlando, which was a two point four billion dollar job. Um, you know, we had uh, we actually had a billion dollar job here in Phoenix. We had a billion dollar job in Hawaii. We had a bunch of work going in Guam. Anyway, the division was struggling. The manager had, had left. And so I got asked to go do that. So yeah. I spent, uh, I don't know, about three years, I guess, uh, doing that. And so in that job, I got on an airplane pretty much every single Monday morning and went somewhere. And, uh, you know, the, the jobs that we had were challenging. We had really big, you know, big mega jobs. Some of them were struggling. And uh, so it was a it was a challenging job. You know, leadership. I pretty much put a new leadership team in place in mm. every region. 
So it was a it was a challenging job, uh, and like I said, I got in, I got tired of doing that. So I decided uh, in 2000, yeah, I retired in June of 2022. Anyway, before before uh, we jump great. into uh, before we jump into retirement, retiring, uh, what, what talk to us about that Tap and Z project? Love to hear about you know just some some details, whatever comes to mind. I mean, that's a really amazing project. Yeah, it's a design build job. There were uh, four partners on the job. It was Granite, American Bridge, Trailer Brothers, and Floor were the partners on the job. On a big mega mm-hmm. job like that, a uh, company doesn't want to take that on by themselves. You know, it could, mm-hmm. you know, it could ruin a company. In fact, that job was a really challenging job, and it almost took down. I don't know. I mean, it was a monster. It, uh, you know, it. it I don't know how many people actually during the height of the thing, but when I came into the division, the job was winding down. But um, anyway, there were, you know, there were thousands of people working on the job during the the height of the job. But it was design build. So we had a designer who, you know, designed it. And then we obviously built what uh, what they designed. I mean, just a really challenging, challenging job, but a really, really interesting job. How does how does the process work when you know you gotta I don't know, drive piles into the bottom of you know that that river whatever water you know circumstance that exists? How do you do that and how do you progress across right as you're bridging across? Well, there's you know there's various different types of piles and uh, anyway you you know that that job I remember what. Uh, what those piles were but anyway you i mean you've got a pile hammer that you set piles in a template that holds them in place Mm. and you've got a hammer that just beats on them and drives them into the ground until you uh you know you achieve a like a design tip or you just achieve like a design blow count where you've got enough friction on the pile to support the load Mm. that uh you know that it's designed to support so i mean it's not you know it's not hard you just Set the pile in there in a template and hammer on it until you drive it down as far as uh, as far as it needs to go. And that template is, I guess, being set uh, in the, in the water. Is that what's kind of like framing well, the pile? The, temp- the, the template will be on top of the water. Um, you know, and mm. actually, the template will have some temporary piles that hold the template in place. I see. And anyway, then you know, the template has an opening that the pile that guides the pile as you drive it. But yeah, you set mm. the template. And, you know, it, it, you know, you don't need to drive the piles for the template very deep and then, you know, set piles inside that right. and, and drive them. Okay. Yeah. So already more logical than, you know, what I had perceived up front. How, how did those uh, templates get set? I mean, are people diving at all or is it all just from like a boat? Uh, pretty much from a boat. Uh, you know, there mm. are divers sometimes for various different things but really uh, you don't need divers to set up aisle table wow if you know that's pretty incredible yeah or Mm -hmm. sometimes for underwater demo you need divers we had some divers on tap and z but uh you know for various different things but uh but yeah you don't you don't need divers to to drive pile Mm. okay yeah awesome that's yeah, I, I was expecting some uh, you know, cr- crazy answer. Um, you know, you're, you're so you're driving piles, and then I mean, you're not. Yeah, you're driving the piles in the water, but where you're mm-hmm. driving them is on top of the water. You don't have a hammer down in yeah. the water driving piles. You're driving from the top, and then you build a cap on top of the piles that's out of the water. So mm-hmm. uh, you know the structure that you build. You know the piles obviously go down through the water, but you know the structure you're building on top of them is above the water. So all you're above, doing yeah. in the water is is driving piles. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you for uh, sharing that insight and explaining that. So sure. before we uh, before we move into retiring, out of curiosity, because you know we kind of breeze past it, and I want to ask um, that period between discharging and starting at Granite, uh, it, it almost sounded like it was a few weeks in the end, or how, how long was that period? Uh, yeah, it was actually a few weeks. Uh, in fact, wow. I got out and I had some leave saved up. Uh, I got out. Uh, it was right before Christmas in 1991. And uh, anyway, I started to work for Granite. So I left Fort Carson maybe a few days before Christmas in 1991. And I started with Granite on January 15th of 1992. So it was a couple of weeks. 
Um, it wasn't wow. like, like I said, I already had everything all lined up. So, uh, you know, they were, they were waiting for me. It just took me some time to get moved and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. kind of get settled and get the family. I feel we're one, one child at that point and, uh, mm -hmm. get the, you know, get the family settled and take a little vacation and start, start the new job. Wow, that that's pretty amazing. I mean, first of all, that's a quick turnaround, and then second of all, to have also moved with a kid. I mean, that that's a lot. Did did you feel, I don't know, a, any sense of uh, disconnect in that position in that period of time, or was it just very similar to what you were doing in the military? Anyhow, that you were able to transition. Well, yeah, I don't know if it was similar um, to tell you. I mean, it was a long time ago. Uh, mm. you know, it was it was. Uh, what was that? Thirty, you know, thirty-two years ago, uh, mm -hmm. or more. Thirty. Anyway, long time ago. Um, yeah. You know, I don't. I don't know that I felt any. You know, I don't. I don't know that I felt any disconnect. You know, maybe one thing that helped me too is I had a friend, like as I mentioned. So it was a help uh, to right. you know any questions I had or transition. And I actually moved. So we moved from Colorado Springs to Tucson, Arizona. And Tucson, Arizona was 180 miles from where I grew up. And we lived out in the middle of nowhere. So, you know, our big shopping, uh, you know, we went to Tucson probably once every couple of months. So I was familiar with Tucson. Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I don't remember it being, you know, I don't remember it being that much of a challenge. So it was probably, you know, it was probably lucky, but, uh, Wow. But yeah, and we I mean, that's great. Around, yeah, we moved around mm -hmm. quite a bit, you know, in the military. So, uh, it you know, we were used to moving. So it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't a huge right. challenge. Yeah, wow. I mean, amazing to hear. That's the best outcome that could, that can be. You know, um, and one thing we yeah. try to do, you know, mm -hmm. anybody that's transitioning is find a, find a mentor in the company that you're going to. And hopefully most companies who hire veterans have a program where they do set them mm -hmm. up with a, a sponsor where they do have somebody that they can build a relationship with and, you know, answer any questions that they have and just be a resource for them. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. It sounds like Granite, you're saying Granite has that program. They do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Granite, yeah, so Granite you know, I, I, I was the first, I think, veteran that Granite had hired, but hmm. for whatever reason, after they hired me, they, they, we do, I mean, we tried to, we tried to actively recruit yeah. veterans. We used to go to military recruiting conferences. Um, so, mm. and you know, to this day, Granite's uh, Granite is trying to, you know, to recruit veterans. We have a we, we have a lady who's one of our recruiters, who is also an Army veteran, and she is really keen on recruiting veterans. So she puts a lot of effort into uh, into trying to recruit veterans lady named Tori Bears. She's a she's a great mm -hmm. lady and and is is uh, has a vested interest in making sure that we recruit that. I mean amazing. I'm very happy to hear that. Really interesting to uh hear that program that they've implemented, which I think is very valuable. Um which is, you know, that mentorship program to link someone up with a mentor. And I would suggest that, you know, if the company that you're starting with or if you haven't yet started your career as a veteran, I mean, you don't need a you know mentorship program necessarily to you know find one. Rather, you can, for example, get on LinkedIn and start reaching out to people um, at a company that you're looking at. You know who you find has a veteran within it. Ask them to sure. mentor you. I'm sure they'll be happy to to do so. So um, that's Absolutely. a great call out in terms of supporting with transition period is finding yourself a mentor. So that, awesome to hear that Granite has that implemented. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we went through um, and we kind of you kind of touched on this uh, several times as you were talking about your, your career. Uh, but I want to, you know, in particular highlight um, these translatable skill sets, right, military mm -hmm. uh, to uh, profession. Um, and what I meant when I asked in terms of doing something similar and asking this as a question as well, doing something similar from, you know, military when you started your career at uh, granted, was, I mean, essentially just the engineering uh, element, right? The engineering aspect to it. Uh, granted, right. that was also uh, something that you studied. Uh, nonetheless, would love to hear your your take on translatable skills, uh, okay. both uh, kind of, yeah, go ahead. You know, the, to me, the biggest probably translatable skill that you learn in the military are leadership skills. 
Um, mm. You know, I think the military probably has the best leadership training of, you know, of anybody. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's probably the biggest translatable skill. As far as technical skills for, you know, for construction, you know, I, I mean, we built a bunch of projects, but, you know, we weren't having to read plans and specs and, mm. uh, you know, you know, productivity wasn't, I mean, we weren't, you know, we weren't, you know, although we had budgets for a lot of our projects, we weren't, uh, you know, as concerned about productivity as, uh, you know, as a private company is. So, you know, as far as technical skills, cool skills that, you know, that moved with me, I mean, I had some, I had some scheduling training when I was in the military, you know, I kind of knew how to put a CPM schedule together. Uh, so hmm. I had a few relatable skills, but really, to me, the big skill is leadership. Um, you know, that's what you learn mm -hmm. in the military. You probably learn work ethic because, you know, you may work around the clock. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, work ethic, uh, uh, integrity, work ethic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and leadership are probably some of the some of the biggest things. You know, when you transition, the company that you transition to is going to teach you what you need to know from a technical right. standpoint um, for the right. most part. Uh, you know, I would say maybe some advice is, uh, you know, someone who's maybe spent six years in the military is not going to be equivalent to somebody who has been working for a certain company in a given position for six years. So don't right. price yourself out of the market. That's one of the things that maybe we saw that was a barrier to recruit on, uh, you know, military folks who were transitioning was, mm -hmm. you know, they were pricing themselves too high. You know, uh, I, I would, uh, you know, I don't know, there's probably resources that people have talked to where you can kind of figure out what, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, you know, a fair pay would be for a job. But we, we were seeing people that were, you know, maybe six-year uh, military officers that were looking for the same money as we were paying six year project managers and, you know, without mm -hmm. the skill set that those folks had. So maybe be willing to start slightly lower than what, you know, what an equivalent time and grade uh, guy who's been with a civilian company or guy or gal who's been with a civilian company and, you know, then apply your leadership skills, apply your work ethic and you'll rise up and, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get ahead of those folks in a few years. And, you know, the military folks that we hired, I never saw a case where that didn't happen, where those people just rose mm -hmm. to the top and, you know, were, were ahead of their peers in a short period of time. But don't price yourself out of the market, uh, you, know, it, you know, when you enter civilian life. Mm -hmm. Be willing to start at maybe, uh, you know, at, at a little, little lower pay scale. Yeah, very well said. Where, you know, veterans should take their experience in the military and translate it into business at the same time, you are nonetheless take, going into a different industry, right, per se. So if you're working right. yeah, I don't you're know, at in, an entry level position, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. You're not, you know, you're yeah. not going to be equivalent to some. Yeah. And just like a, a different random example, if you were working in the field in construction, then all of a sudden went to uh, lending for projects. I mean, you take the same kind of a hit, right? Regardless of how many years of experience, However, you can still leverage the fact that you do have unique leadership experience and just you know other abilities and capabilities to translate into business that will allow you to kind of expedite that process exactly as you mentioned uh, that that you were seeing in Granite in terms of you know growing in the ranks of business per se. So uh, awesome call out. It's just recognize that you're transitioning uh, industries really, uh, so you have right. to you know take that on the chin per se and. Uh, grow into the role and, and excel uh, thereafter. Um, well right. said. Yeah, yeah. So you know, maybe one other word of mm -hmm. advice to people. I mean, it seems to me Please. today that people want to move around from company to company. You know, they'll work here mm -hmm. for a couple of years and then they'll maybe get an offer. I mean, it's a uh, you know, it's a competitive job market out there. There's lots of jobs, um, and you know, it's tough to find good employees today, but. Stick, stick with a company. Find a company you like and stick with them. You know, a, a lot of people tend to jump from company to company to company. And I'll tell you, when I got a resume of somebody who had only worked at a company for a couple of years and then moved on and had a history of doing that, I threw the resume. 
So, hmm. you know, find a company you like. And I think if you change careers maybe a couple of times, it's okay, but don't jump around from company to company. Um, I think that's a, a turn off to a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, for some reason, I, I could be very off and granted my essentially entire career is in the AC industry, but I do feel like in our industry, it is a little bit different from what you would see in, I don't know, like a, a media industry where, or, or tech, right, where potentially people are bouncing around more and it's maybe more accepted. I think in mm -hmm. AEC, it's a little bit, um, you know, more expected that you're going to have some 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 loyalty. Um, do right. you, what do you what do you think about that in your experience? Yeah, no, I completely agree. Yeah, I completely mm. agree. Yeah, I spent you know yeah. I spent thirty thirty one years with the same company. So uh, yeah, you know, and, <laughs> I mean, I got a lot of offers and I got contacted by a lot of headhunters along the way and. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fortunately, I stayed happy and worked for a big company. And, uh, you know, I could have probably gone from place to place for maybe short term gains. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, I think I think sticking with the same company worked out. You know, the other maybe the mm -hmm. other one other word of advice, I would say we saw a lot Please. of transitioning military folks go through headhunters. In today's mm -hmm. market, and the headhunters are probably going to shoot me here, but uh, in today's market, <laughs> I would not recommend hiring him. I mean, there's lots of jobs out there. You know, there's, yeah. there's, it's easy to, you know, to do some research and figure out who you might want to work for and send resumes. And, uh, you know, that's a turnoff to a lot of companies, particularly in this job market where it's so competitive. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't go through that. But we did see a hmm. lot of folks that were transitioned from the military use use headhunters. Sure, yeah. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, I'm sure it's it's a little daunting to, you know, figure out that process, but it is something you could figure out and sure. uh, just do, do, do it yourself. Research and pick, you know, pick exactly. half a dozen companies you want to work for and yeah, I mean reach out to them. It's easy to figure out who to contact and um, yeah. you know, do do that on your own. I think it'll make you a lot. Yeah, great, great tips. Um, so close, closing out here on the professional side of things, I uh, want to give you the floor to talk about some uh, career wins, some you know projects that you're really proud of. I know you, you might you could repeat what you already said. That's totally yeah, fine. Well, but I wanted to see if there's anything yeah, else. No, I mean there were yeah there were a number uh, you know and maybe I'm more proud of the teams I was able to put together. Mm. Um, you know I awesome. I put together some teams of some great people. Uh, you know, I'm really mm -hmm. proud of the team that I worked with when I was region manager. We had a great team. We're one of Granite's, if not maybe Granite's highest performing business units. Um, wow. And so, you know, I'm super proud of the team that I was able to put together there. Similar to the Northwest group, you know, when I managed the Northwest group, I put a new team in almost every region there. And most of those folks are still are still there. Um, and you know, it, I mean, just a great group of people and the, you know, kind of the same in the heavy, heavy civil group, uh, just worked with a great bunch of great folks through my career. Um, and there's been a lot of jobs, you know, it's really rewarding to be able to drive around. I mean, I can drive across the country and say, yeah, we did that. I was part of mm -hmm. that. And, you know, and so it's rewarding to be able to drive around and show your friends and your family. Um, you know, I, I was part of building this, um, and, you know, we built some real uh, signature projects. So it's, you know, that's, that's yeah. rewarding. I mean, I mentioned the border fence. That's, that stands out to me. That was, you know, that was mm. really good work and um, actually kept the company in healthy condition during the downturn, you know, in 2000, you know, eight, nine, 10. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that was a big part of what the company was doing and kind of kept the company healthy through, you know, through that tough time. Um, yeah. So I I felt like I was kind of the you know one of the founding fathers of the border fence program for Granite. Mm -hmm. um, Sounds like it. Yeah. You know, and in yeah, general, and not then, just for Granite, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. We were we were yeah we 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 did the first civilian contract. So exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you know there's lots of other projects that I'm proud to have proud to have worked on. Again, it's you know it's rewarding to be able to go somewhere and show your family. Yeah. I I was part of that. So it's been a, yeah. it was a great career. I enjoyed it. It was, it was, uh, it was a, a great career. You know, when I, when I went through school, you know, in engineering school, they program you to want to go into design. And mm -hmm. that was my thought. I, I thought I'll go into, and then, you know, then, I mean, it's exciting. Something that's new, something new every day. It's a new challenge every day. Uh, 
I love building work out in the field. It's just a very rewarding career. I mean, construction's a great career. I know a lot of people today want to, you know, sit behind a computer, but I can tell you there is no more rewarding career than construction. So it's a great career. Yeah, well said. I mean, first of all, amazing career wins to to highlight. And I totally agree with your last sentiment there where, uh, you know, having, and you were kind of noting this across your your. Uh, career wins when you're talking about driving across the country and pointing out to your family, you know, oh, I was a part of building this. Uh, I think that creating a tangible asset to the last point that you said, something that you could see and feel and look at uh, is pretty amazing and pretty unique to to our industry. Uh, yeah, not many industries could could touch on that. So uh, right. great answer. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just an inspiring thing to be able to do, uh, be out on the field, connect with different people. Uh, and I think for that reason, there's lots of uh, interesting uh, translations from military experiences to uh, our industry. Uh, you know, obviously there's that massive difference between military and civilian. Nonetheless, there's some characteristics that uh, overlap. Um, so yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, that's an awesome answer. Um, so closing out on the career side, we move into kind of like the last phase of uh, our show here, which is uh, an answer to at least one of these. Uh, both of them would be awesome is wellness practice and books you'd recommend. Okay. Yeah, I'll start with wellness practice. So Awesome. You know, take take time for and this is probably something I didn't learn maybe until later in my career, but take hmm. time for yourself, take time for your family, take time to recharge, be involved in your family events. Don't spend all your time at work. Uh early in my hmm. career you know, I went to work at five o'clock in the morning and I got home at six o'clock at night and, you know, didn't attend a lot of my kids things. And anyway, take, take the time to, you know, yeah. any good company is going to encourage you to do that. They don't want, they don't want their employees to work, uh, you know, 14 hours a day. It's not take time for their family. There may be times you need to work that many hours, but that needs to be the exception mm -hmm. rather than the rule. And that's something that I didn't learn until later in my career, but Take time yeah. for yourself, take time for your family, take care of yourself. You know, if you burn out and, uh, and you know, can't do it anymore, you're of no value to the company. So take, take time for yourself. Correct. I mean, maybe that's my wellness, my wellness tip. Well said. You know, a Absolutely lot of people is. in the industry, again, don't, don't do that. You know, they want to get ahead right. and they work odd hours. And I was, I was one of those people, but don't, don't mm -hmm. do that. Take, you know, be there for your kids and be there for your kids events. And I think that's something that. The, the younger generation today probably does a better job of than, um Yeah, I hope so. I hope that's yeah. becoming a little bit more top of mind. And I would also add to what you said in terms of, you know, if, if you don't take that time for yourself, of course, you're, you know, potential to burn out, then you won't be uh, an asset for the company. But also yeah. in that path of burnout, you, you won't be helpful for yourself and those around you either on the personal side. So it's almost twofold, right? Where it's really important right. to... Uh, you know, just give yourself that kind of space when, when, when you need it, when it's important to. Right. You know, maybe one other wellness type thing, if, sure. you know, speaking for the construction industry, if you aren't passionate about it and you don't love it, go do something else because it, mm. it will consume you. Um, and you've got to live it almost. And, you know, <laughs> if you don't, if you don't love it, if you don't look forward to going to work every day, um, Go do something else because it will, you know, it will, it will burn you out. Uh, totally. If you're passionate yeah. about it, it's a great, you know, it's a great career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. Great, great tips. Um, very good tips. All right, moving to uh, the book side of things. Okay. I don't know. You know, maybe one of the books that was formative for me was uh, Seven Habits of, of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. I read mm. that a long, long time ago. And, you know, maybe that's his habits have helped, you know, help shape how I, you know, conducted myself through my career. I think that's a, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's a really good book. I, you know, I don't know if it's one that shows up on the list of suggested reading materials today, but uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a great book. I, awesome. I, you know, I've read it. I've, I've read a bunch of, of, uh, you know, management leadership type books along the years. And that's probably the one maybe that stands out to the most. Yeah. Amazing. That's a great, that's a great recommendation. Um, Dave really appreciate you sharing your story. Uh, really an amazing, amazing life path, uh, career, uh, projects that you worked on, 
it was really awesome hearing about it. Really awesome learning about how a bridge gets built. That's something that's always been top of mind. I never knew or had someone to ask directly. So it was great to learn about that process. Uh, thanks so much for your time and for joining us today. Sure. You bet. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, everyone, all the listeners and subscribers, thanks so much for listening in. Please remember to subscribe, like, comment on our channels, YouTube, uh, Apple, and Spotify. Shout out to our sponsors, Jet.Build. We will see you soon. Take care. Thank you to our channel sponsors, JetBuild. If you're looking for ways to better manage your real estate development and construction projects, look no further. Jet is the command center software for end-to-end real estate development and construction management. That's www.jet.build.